Welcome to my talk, to my introduction talk, Recent Developments in Neurosearch, which I will be giving at the Toronto Machine Learning Summit. I'm Jetz Reimers, I work as a re NLP researcher for Hugging Face, and I'm the creator of Sentence Transformers, which is a framework dedicated for neurosearch. So neurosearch, there's quite a lot of hype, but why is there such a hype? Um, Basic answer is because it works. So for example, here I have a real example on a simple Wikipedia, which has roughly 170,000 documents. And the query is quite simple. What is the capital of the United States? If you ask standard lexical search, elastic search, for example, using BM25, the top three hits are, the first is on capital punishment because it mentions a lot of, mentions capital quite often and United States quite often. Second entry is about Ohio, because it mentions it has states and it's in the United States and it has capital. And the third entry is Nevada, because it also mentions it's United States, it's a state and it has capital. So none of these hits provide any answer to the really simple query from the user. If you contrast it to an out of the box neural search model, the top three hits are the following. First is about Washington DC, mentioning it's the capital of the United States. Second entry is the capital city, so a definition what is a capital city. And the third entry is about the United States capital, because maybe the user misspelled capital and wanted to search for what is the capital of the United States. So here you see, for this really simple example, how much better neural search is compared to lexical search. You can also put it into numbers. So here we have the track robust 4 data set, which is like a really old information retrieval data set from 2004. And as you see over the years here, we see the different years here, we see the different performance. There was like not really much of a progress on this data set. So all the systems were roughly similar to the performance. And here the black line is performance from 2004. However, in 2019 and 2020, pre-trained transformers like BERT entered the game, and we saw a significant performance boost for these models. In this talk, I want to cover different architectures. A lot more architectures are available. First, I want to talk about bi-encoders, then cross-encoders, then I want to briefly talk about Dr. Query and Covert. So by encoders, they work with vector spaces. So you encode all your documents into the vector space. And then when a query arrives, you embed it also in the vector space. And then you check what is the closest document in the vector space for the query. To put it a bit more technical, it looks the following way. So you have your query and you have your document. You pass it through a transformer network, for example, BERT. You do some pooling to get a fixed sized vector. And then you, you compute the cosine similarity between the vector for the query and the vector for the document. And this gives you the score, how similar is the query to the document. And then you return the documents that have the highest cosine similarity. Why encoders have several advantages. First, it can overcome the lexical gap. With a lexical search engine, it makes a difference if you search for US, USA, or United States. If you type in any of these, it will not find any of the others can respect the word order. So for lexical search, it's no difference if you're interested for the visa from Germany to Canada or for the visa from Canada to Germany. Lexical uh, semantic search or by encoders know this is a difference and will find different documents depending on the word order. And it also knows about related terms. So for example, you search for Spearman correlation in NumPy. However, in NumPy, you cannot easily compute the Spearman correlation, but there is a really simple function in SciPy to compute the Spearman correlation. So it will find the entry in Spearman correlation in SciPy because it knows NumPy and SciPy that are quite close and often used interchangeable. These vector spaces are not limited just to text. You can also put images and text into the vector space. So here you put your images into the vector space and you have some queries like two dots in the snow. This is what you're looking for. You put it also in the vector space. You look what is the closest image embedding, and then you return this image to the user. It's also not limited to only English. It can work with many languages. So you have your image here of the two dots in the snow, and then you have your multilingual text encoder, which 
put the, the input independent if you choose German, uh, Spanish, English, Chinese, put it all here in the vector space so you can search for the images in any language you like. How to train these bioencoders? That's quite simple, quite straightforward. So what you need are positive pairs. So for example, you have a question and the answer, or you have an image and the image caption, or you have a paper and a paper title and the paper ab abstract. So you put all these into the vector space. And what you want is you have the question and the matching answer. You want to have this close in the vector space, but all the other answers to this question should be far away in the vector space. The intuition behind that is that it's quite unlikely if you randomly select an answer um, that it matches any of the other given uh, that you when you randomly select an answer it's unlikely that it matches a given question. And so uh, what you do in, in your optimization step so given you have this anchor A1 what is the right answer? So is it P1, P2, P3? As mentioned, it can be question answer or it can be an image and a caption is always the same. So you compute for all these three options, the score. So what's the cosine similarity in, in the vector space? And then you say, okay, the, the correct answer at the first entry and the other two options are the wrong options. And you do back propagation using the cross entropy loss. How to improve the performance of bioencoders? Here we have a really nice visualization from the Rocket QA paper. Here we see the number of the batch size, and here we see the performance on a popular data set. And as we see, the larger the batch size, um, the better the performance. So that's the most simple win we can do. Just increase the batch size, you get a better model. The intuition behind that is the following. So assume you have a batch size of 10, then you have a question given, and you have 10 possible answers. So it's really simple to find the correct answer. If you increase the batch size to 1,000 passages, you have a question given and 1,000 passages given. It's a lot harder to find the correct uh, passage for this, um, for this question. The other trick is to use hard negatives. So that the red line here, as we see with hard negatives, performance increases a lot. So what are hard negatives? You, instead of having pairs where you have a question and answer. Now you have a triplet. You have the anchor, you have the positive, and you have the negative. So for all your data points, you need triplets. And the negatives, they should be similar to the positives, but they should not match with the anchor. So for example, here's a bad example. Your anchor is how many people live in London. Your positive is around 9 million people live in London. A bad negative example would be London has a population of 9 million people because this negative matches with the, with the anchor. And you do not want to have this because we will train the model such that the negative will be far away from the anchor. But here, this, this would be quite bad for the model. A good example, however, would be um, around 1 million people live in Birmingham, second to London. So it also talks about people who live in, in the UK city also talks about London, but it does not provide the answer to how many people live in London. So a user would be quite unhappy to see this as an answer to his or her uh, input question. The second architecture I would like to present are cross encoders. They work the following way. So you have some document collection, you have some retrieval stage. The retrieval can be by encoder, but it can also be lexical search with BM25. And then you have your search query or question, you pass it to the first stage retrieval, which gives you uh, some candidates. For example, you retrieve 100 candidates. So these 100 documents, they could match with the query. And then you use a cross encoder as a re-ranker. So you take the 100 documents you retrieve, you re-rank them to find like the top 10 documents, and you present these top 10 documents to the user. Cross encoder works the following way. So instead of passing query and document independently to a transformer network, you concatenate them as one long input to a transformer network like Word. So here we have the query, here we have the document, and then we do the cross attention between all the words in the query and all the words in the document. And at the end, we get some score between zero and one. How relevant is the document for the query? 
So the big advantage of cross encoders is the better performance. So here in the plot, we see the performance of a cross encoder. And here we see the performance of a bi encoder. And we see here the, the training size in 1000 examples. And here's the performance. And as we see the cross encoder consistently achieves better performances than a bi encoder. And especially when you decrease the training data, um, you, we see quite a big drop for bi encoders, but for cross encoders, the drop is not so big. So cross encoders achieve better performances. They need less data. They are also more stable to new domains, but cross encoders need a first retrieval stage. So we need some system that picks some candidates. If you use BM25 for that, you still have the lexical gap issue. And cross encoders, this is the biggest disadvantage. They are really slow. So by encoder, they can do retrieval in 50, 50 milliseconds. Cross encoders need like nearly 500 milliseconds. So you have to wait like half a second um, to get your search results, which is like quite a big delay. The next architecture I would like to present is Dr. Quir. Works in the following way. So you have some input document, and then you have some sequence to sequence generation model, for example, a T5 model, which given a document produces queries. So it predicts which type of queries could a user ask. Uh, which would be happy about this retrieving this document. And then you simply concatenate them. So you take your original document, you generate 40 different queries. You can concatenate them as one document, and then you index it into like, for example, Lucene or Elasticsearch, and you run standard user search on it and retrieves the, the documents. The final architecture I want to present is Coldboard. So in a bi encoder, we created one embedding for the query and one embedding for the document. Now in Colbert, we create many embeddings for the query. So here for every token, we create one embedding. And for the documents, we also create many embeddings for every, embe uh, for every token in the document, we create an embedding. And then we do a many to many comparison to compute the final score. So far, um, it sounded like neural retrieval is really great. However, there are like some downsides. One of the biggest downsides, in my opinion, is that you need a lot of training data. So a lot of these systems have been trained on 100,000 of pairs. And having this type of training data is often only suitable for big companies uh, or only suitable for already popular products. So if you run Google search, for example, it's easy to get 100,000 uh, pairs from user interaction. But new companies, academics, and also niche use cases are left out. So if you have some wiki on some special topic and you want to create like a new research on this wiki, um, you, you do not get like this type of, of training data. You do not easily get like 100,000 of pairs. So in our research, we asked look, the question like, how well do models generalize to new domains and tasks? And Finally, how to improve the performance from unlabeled data. So following this, we created BEER, the benchmarking AI, uh, IR data set. Here we selected nine tasks and 80 data sets, which are really diverse. So we have, for example, um, some fact checking data sets. We have news retrievals. We have tweet retrievals where you want to uh, retrieve tweets. We have data from biomedical AR, where you have scientific publications you want to retrieve. So we, we selected a lot of data sets. And then we benchmarked a lot of different neural search systems, also systems that presented previously. And the question was like, okay, we did not train them on any of these 18 data sets. Uh, how well do they generalize when they have been trained on the different data set of the MS Marco data set? So the winner, the clear winner is using a cross encoder. So here we use BM25 plus a cross encoder and it improved the performance on 16 out of 18 data sets. It also gave like the best performance on most of the data sets. Second best system was Dr. Query using a T5 system and Colbert also performed quite nicely. Bi encoders in contrast, here we tested different bi encoders, test B, NC, DPR and so on we saw that they only work for some data sets. So for some data sets, they give like a really nice improvement, but for other data sets, they fail to perform. So for example, if you have a news article and you want to find uh, tweets talking about this news article, 
they perform quite poorly if there is such a big task and domain shift. However, you should not judge systems only by their performance and how well they generalize. What's also important for search is the speed and the index size. So here we see that uh, BM25 plus a cross encoder is really slow. So if you have a GPU, it's half a second. If you only have a CPU, you have like six seconds delay to answer the search question. Also similar, Cobert is also quite slow and the index is really large. So instead of 400 megabytes for the index, you need 20 gigabytes of, for the index. Um, Dr. Query, they are better than um, BM25, but they can have issues with lexical gap, and it also does not respect the word order. By encoders, they are fast and have a small index, but as mentioned, they have issues to generalize to unseen domains. So in summary, we see a significant improvement by neural search. Um, models, however, models require large training data sets. So if you have only little or no training data sets, it's hard to use them. However, you can use pre-trained models from other data sets. Cross encoders, they give the best performance. They are robust domain shifts. So you can train it in one domain and then apply it on a completely different text domain. However, they can be quite slow. Bioencoders, bioencoders in contrast, they are really fast, but they have issues with domain shifts. So if you train it on one domain and then apply it to a completely different domain, performance drops significantly. The current research topic, which is really hot, is how to use cross encoders to teach bioencoders. So if you first train a cross encoder, and then you use this cross encoder to predict uh, scores for the bioencoder and the bioencoder can learn a lot from the cross encoder and can close the gap, the performance gap and the domain shift issue. So here I want to give a teaser for a recent project we will launch, the Project Infinity. Um, so we will launch it next week, so sign up for the launch. So it's really simple to, to improve the generalization and performance for neural search. One trick is to use larger model. So larger model is better than a smaller model. And the other trick is to use a cross encoder. A cross encoder is better than biocoder. However, larger models are slower than smaller models and cross encoders are also slower than bioencoders. So, and in, in search, you always have to, to respect the latency. So in infinity, we, created like a solution which optimizes the inference. So it's a containerized solution which you can deploy on your cloud, on your machines, where we optimize the inference, every step of the inference, and we achieve performances which are at least two or three times faster than standard hugging face transformers inference. So for example, if you have a GPU, you can get a bird inference in one milliseconds. On a CPU, you can get a bird inference in, in four milliseconds, which makes it really appealing, this project for search. So if you're interested, sign up next week for the launch where we will present the project in more detail. Also, finally, um, have a look on sentence transformers, sbird.net. So it's a framework where you can train your own models. You find over 200 pre-trained models by encoder, cross encoder, stock to query, which you can easily use and deploy in your, in your environment for your neural search area. You find training data sets with over 1 billion pairs, and currently sadly only for English, but you find multilingual models for more than 100 languages, you find tutorials, and also feel free to follow me. Um, my current research focus is on domain adaptation, low resource and multilingual search. So how can you adapt these approaches if you do not have a lot of training data or if you work on a different language than English? Thank you for listening. <laughs>